Hello friends, welcome to Simple Christianity. Today we are going to talk about a great subject, the secret to a happy life. A time poll conducted in 2019 found that happiness is found in relationships. The question posed to those who were being polled was, what one thing in your life brought you the greatest happiness? People found happiness mostly in family relationships, especially with their children and grandchildren, as well as spousal relationships. God, faith, religion was second on that time poll. In fact, in most polls, surveys, and studies conducted, the number one thing that consistently makes the top of the list of what makes people happy is family. Generally, relationship. The Bible does not talk about a happy life. What we find in Scripture is the idea of being fulfilled. The Greeks had a word for being happy. It conveys the idea of contentment, the idea of being satisfied with where you are in life. You are blessed. The Greek word is makarios. Jesus used this word in the Sermon on the Mount. It is translated as blessed in most Bibles. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, and so forth. By the way, the English words happy and happen come from the same noun. Its meaning is chance or fortune. And so in English speaking cultures, we tend to view happiness in terms of events that make us happy or things that come our way that might make us happy. The fulfilled life, on the other hand, will bring a perpetual joy to your life. Joy is not based on circumstances. It transcends things that happen. Having said all that, Scripture basically says the same that you find in the polls as to what constitutes the blessed life, the fulfilled life, the happy life. It is God and relationships. However, Scripture defines these relationships and it uncovers the key to a happy life. Stay with me. And let's dig deeply into this subject. One of the best passages in Scripture addressing the idea of a fulfilled life, which will bring you joy, is found in the first epistle of St. John. John was writing some 60 years after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was an eyewitness of these events and of the ministry of Jesus on earth. He writes and says, that which was from the beginning. A reference to the gospel, which was embodied by Jesus Christ himself. John heard and saw with his own eyes. He touched Jesus with his own hands. He was an eyewitness of these events. He was writing and John was contemplating this amazing adventure. He seemed like a man in awe and disbelieved that he was actually there. As he looks back, some 60 years later, John appears mesmerized on the fact that he was actually part of the greatest event in the history of humanity. And there's plenty of evidence, both internal and external, that it was John who wrote this epistle and that he wrote it in the 90s AD. That's for you doubters out there. The earliest church fathers give plenty of testimony to this fact. John was there from the beginning. You see, the faith had to be established on the testimony of reliable witnesses. The standard was established early in the history of the church. To replace Judas, the apostles had to select one who had been there from the beginning, and he had to have been an eyewitness of the resurrection. See Acts 1. 
John met the standard. He was there from the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He was there on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was there on the Sermon on the Mount. He heard a man preach for three years, of whom it was said, no one ever spoke like this man before. And John was there at so many other miracles performed by Christ. Miracles that defied nature. We have reliable witnesses that give us a sure account of the events surrounding the life of Jesus Christ. Peter, who was, un, uh, who was another witness, who was there from the beginning, he met the standard. He wrote in his epistle, We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Take that. Back to our passage. John further wrote, What we are proclaiming is concerning the word of life. Oh, there's so much to say about this word of life. In the Gospel of John, the same writer, John the Apostle, said that the word was with God before the beginning began. Literally, that's what it says. And the word was God. Of course, the Greek word in this passage is logos or logos. It means the spoken word, reasoning, expression. Jesus is the logos of life. The word is the logos, the logos of life. In that very same passage of John 1, it is said that in him was life. But let us continue with our text. The life was made manifest. He was with the Father and was made manifest to us. The Gospel of John says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That Word dwelt, quote-unquote dwelt, in its original Greek language, literally means He pitched a tent among us. He tabernacled among us. In the Old Testament, the tabernacle was the place where God manifested his presence, his glory. The glory of God is his nature. It is his character. The nature of God is what makes him shine, his glory. When you look at the life of Jesus Christ as depicted in the Gospels, you are witnessing the very nature of God. The glory of God is in full display. He is full of grace and truth. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father, Jesus said. He is the image of the invisible God. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. Verse 3 of our text. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. The proclamation of this message brings us into fellowship. Greek word koinonia brings us into koinonia, which means a common union. The word indicates the setting aside of private interest and desire and joining in with others for common purposes. The proclamation of the gospel, the revelation of the Son of God, creates a new kind of people. They are the assembly, the ecclesia Greek, the church of God. And they have a special union. They are referred to as the family of God in the New Testament. That is why the New Testament members of the church refer to each other as brothers and sisters. This wasn't a cliche for the first century Christians. 
They were a group that really looked out for each other, a family. Today we use the term, but we lack the same meaning, sadly. The reality is that too often we don't even know the names of the people who go to church with us. The book of Acts says that those who believed were together and had all things in common. And they shared their possessions as any had need. The same book, which by the way is a historical account of the early church, says that they took care of the widows and they took care of the orphans. That's what families who love one another do for each other. Jesus said, by this all will know that you are my disciples because of your love for one another. The early Christians were heavily persecuted for their faith, but they endured all hardships because they had a family that looked out for them. They had a family that really supported them. John says, oh man, this is good. John says, we, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. It is God who through this message shines in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We see the very nature of God in the presentation of Jesus Christ. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son. Oh, that's marvelous. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Oh, in that relationship, we are called to exhibit the character and communicable attributes of God. In our fellowship, we let the light of God that has been revealed in us to shine through us. Meaning that we share the love of God, the grace of God, the goodness of God, the righteousness of God, the forgiveness of God, the kindness of God, and so on, and so on. In all these relationships, we manifest the attributes of God. John further says in verse 4 of our text, and we are writing these things so that you, or excuse me, so that your joy may be complete. Listen, there is nothing more fulfilling than to have a family that you enjoy life with, people that you care for, and that you know they care for you as well. A relationship where there is true love without hypocrisy, where the numbers, where the members, where the members of this family do look out for each other with unconditional love. Hear me. We are created in the image of God to enjoy each other in close relationships. When we are able to tame the monster that is in us, that is sin, through our union with Christ and with the help of the Holy Spirit, then we can experience a joyful fellowship with God and with our brothers and sisters. We're able to manifest the character of God. And we are in communion with the Father, with the Son, and with the Ecclesia of God, the Church of God. It is a sweet fellowship. Unfortunately, a lot of churches are not structured this way. They are professional churches, business-like churches. Some ministers have designed a church model that is centered around activities. It's quick entertainment. They seek to keep people quote-unquote, happy, with activities, events. It's all about providing an atmosphere that is fun and doesn't take much of your time. And so the people come to the church, get a quick music fix, a quick entertaining sermon, and they go home. That's what church has become for some in the modern day age. It is an environment that only benefits a few, the ministers. They have these big churches and 
they have a little circle around them, usually family members or old friends, but the majority of the members of the church are outsiders. They do not enjoy a true fellowship. It is no wonder that many Christians today fare no better than the rest of the world when it comes to being fulfilled or having a joyful life. There are a lot of churchgoers who are very lonely and miserable. Listen, listen. If you are a Christian lost in one of these empty churches where, where you are just a, a, a statistic, I urge you to find a church where you can really be counted as a family, where there is no corruption, nepotism, cronyism, and the like. A church where all the members count, where the last is first and the first is last. That's where true happiness lies. That's where the fulfilled joy is found. A common union where each member is truly a part of the body of Christ and individually members of one another. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, leave your comments below. If you found this lecture beneficial, share it with someone else. Don't forget to give us a like and to subscribe to our channel. Until next time, may the love of God and the fellowship of the saints fill your hearts with joy.